Now we come on to the last major unit on um, applications, um, web search, or information retrieval, or text mining. These are three related areas. And we, um, we do, we start actually off this, uh, this particular uh, unit. Well, the first lesson of this unit has a short discussion of data mining in general, not actually specifically for web search. But just to put everything in context and show which things we're discussing, how they fit in the general taxonomy of approaches to data mining. Then we state the problem of web search, what the web is, and what its structure is, which parts are linked to which other parts, and there's the nice, uh, the nice pretty shapes you can get there, and the parlors you have, but the number of uh, URLs in a, in a page. Um, we look at web search in general, starting with its history. It's now, of course, incredibly sophisticated. But it started off relatively simply. And you can even relate it to libraries and things like that. We have, um, in the, the, in, in, from a computer science point of view, web search started off as information retrieval. And there are various key features of information retrieval, so called the simplest Boolean query, yes, no answer to a set of structured queries. We have fuzzy versions of that. We have vector space models. We have probabilistic models. And here we have a little diversion to do something which, you, which I used to do when I was a child, namely to discuss the different views of statistics. Is a, a frequency view or the Bayesian view, which is a Probability view that uh, that uh, actually a probability is not just a frequency; it's a measure of your belief that something will something is true. Then we look at the actual analytics for a web search, and then going into detail, we show how to prepare a document, how to how, what the inverted index looks like, how we construct that index, uh, how we process the query. And then we come on to the key brilliant idea which created Google PageRank, which was a very, because when we do web search, we don't just want to get the possible answers, we have to rank them. And there's a set of concepts like hops, authorities, and page rank, which allow you to identify particularly good things to return to the user and why you're being in Google and, and others. Uh, returns such wonderful results, which uh, often so seem like to pick out of the tens of millions of possible responses, ones when the first page, which are so near to what you want. Uh, then we um, discuss how to crawl the web. Uh, there's some interesting issues of um, which is sort of web advertising. And then there are other ways of doing the search other than just uh, returning uh, uh, documents, which are maybe better illustrated by things like Google News, where Google News actually collects cl clusters, uh, many I many um, links together, which have a similar um, topic of, of interest attached to them. So there's a lot of um, work, actually in computer science and in industry, on so-called topic models and clustering documents together. And using that to give a different type of response, and um, that ends that that uh, those two units on web search and text mining. Then we come across then in the next set of uh, of uh, units corresponds to various technologies. Um, these will differ according to the track. So this these uh, this talk is for the Python track, and we start off with KMEs done in Python. And we give the actual algorithm, and we actually look at the code and things like that. And we take a we also given on that we know about random variables. We can actually generate artificial clusters randomly with random properties, and we cluster those. We generate them and then cluster them, and show quite amusingly how you find these uh, false minima and and things like that, and how you get pretty amusing results from time to time. Typically, you get the right answer, but actually more interesting is the wrong answer, at least for this class. It's not so interesting if you're doing real, if you care about the clusters for some operational issue, but uh, for the class, the wrong answer is the most interesting. Then we have a discussion of MapReduce, which I say is a pretty mediocre discussion. And this, you, I strongly recommend you take the real class on MapReduce. And uh, <coughs> 
We have an introduction which uh, uses a, a, a presentation done by Judy Chu and a student, Salia, on uh, Sam, who uh, sucks and who was, uses, um, blends fruit and uses the MapReduce technology to blend fruit. And that illustrates the key ideas of MapReduce. And then we look at some more advanced topics in that field. But to say this is this is just a brief discussion to to, uh, to add a little value to to this particular general class. Uh, then we have um, a little um, set of lessons on k-means and MapReduce. Um, and um, here. We just point out that we've modified the k-means code in the um, SciPy um, distribution so that it actually is appropriate for MapReduce. And then we run it actually and show that it gives the same answer. Although we don't actually run it under MapReduce, but we do run maps followed by reduce, reduce things. So we do maps and we do reduce. We just don't run them at control by Hadoop or some fancy MapReduce technology. But it illustrates the key idea of how you break things up into maps and you follow the maps by a reduce operation. Then we go to page rank, and under page rank we discuss two things. Actually calculating the page rank from a matrix. And we do simple examples of six by six and eight by eight matrices. Um, and then we do the page find then we find out the page rank of a real page by just extracting it from web the web. Uh, using a Python call to the web. So that's the end of the technologies for this particular uh, course, the ones we cover. And then we have three final values of x. The first value of x is health informatics. We start off by broadly discussing where big data is important in health. We go through uh, three reports, the McKinsey report on the big data revolution in US healthcare, finding out how big data is going to change everything. Uh, we have a little aside from Microsoft, <coughs> a couple of slides uh, on how they think big data is used in health. Then we have an EU report, which is not that dissimilar in flavor from the McKinsey report in what it's trying to suggest. That by using all this information and making all this information available more broadly, you can really change the ground rules of health. You can make health uh, not just the uh, Health is not just uh, uh, focused on the wealthier people, but everybody can have good health by just making information available. Then we have a rather short discussion of clouds and health, which is pretty unsatisfactory. There is no very good discussion, as far as I can see at the moment, on clouds and health. Even though clouds have been used in health, it's, <coughs> it's currently pretty secret. And I don't know of any very good very um, easy to, to probe uh, places to study that. Finally, we have an area where there is plenty of information actually on using clouds. That's uh, the core academic research in genomics and proteomics and how you visualize those things by mapping them to, to three dimensions. So that area is pretty solid and that can use clouds. But uh, using clouds to process uh, electronic medical records or health records, that's Obviously, there's lots of security issues, and and it's very important because it will be more efficient. And in principle, you can share information and make the um, make results from one patient help other patients stay alive and things like that. But that's not so easy to find out about. Next uh, unit is on sensors, uh, and the sensors are we. Illustrated by the Internet of Things, where we already pointed out that 24 to 50 billion billion sensors uh, will be deployed, and by 2020, there's there are many. You know, when you go to the web, you can find out lots of different answers. I found two credible answers: one was 24 and one was 50. But I'm not sure it matters so much between those numbers. They're both pretty big. Uh, we, clouds are clearly Wonderful architecture for processing sensors, because sensors are small, and clouds love processing lots of small things. We give some examples from earth science, which in sort of includes environmental and polar science. Um, and uh, those, a lot of that work is done by sensors, whether tiny sensors or large satellites. 
and we give some examples there. A very important area, interesting area for sensors, ubiquitous uh, cities or smart cities or smart homes, where we believe, or at least the world, some people in the world believe that we, we, the world will get covered by sensors. Those sensors will report all their information to the uh, to the cloud, the cloud will process it and summarize and compare it and control it and change many aspects of our life. Career has a particular emphasis in this area with the concept of ubiquitous career. And they have some advantages because they have such good cell phone coverage. They have more bandwidth for people than anybody else in the, in the world. And the final example, which is uh, slower to do in the US because it requires working with established infrastructure, namely the electrical utility infrastructure, the so-called smart grid, where again, deploying sensors throughout the grid can help uh, control power usage, um, identify faults more quickly, and so on. So the smart grid is correctly believed to be very important. And again, the cloud will process all this data. Clouds are very appropriate for lots and lots of things being being gathered together. Finally, we get to a discussion of the uh, last uh, unit of the class, which is radar informatics. Pretty interesting area. Radar gets lots of data, requires a lot of processing, typically image processing and signal processing. The particular case we will cover here is glaciology where we will start off with this motivation, which is uh, clearly motivated for polar science by um, the, the, some rapid, slightly alarming changes of the ice sheets and the glaciers at the North and South Pole and actually on mountains. Then we'll give a broad discussion of remote sensing. We will give the background of that, that global climate change and why we need to integrate polar science with Ocean, ocean um, predictions and atmosphere predictions and environmental predictions and put them all together to give global climate change uh, predictions. If the <coughs> if the uh, North and South Poles melted, you would be uh, pretty unhappy if you lived near the ocean today. Uh, we give a broad discussion of ice sheet science, um, a discussion of the radar and um, it's basic technology, and then describes what we're doing at Indiana University, and which is largely in collaboration with the so-called uh, Science and Technology Center, Croesus, uh, led by uh, brilliant uh, people at Kansas University. And then we'll discuss um, how we're doing it with some early results. So that's the, um, the end of this. Um, course, the last unit, and I thank everybody who's made it to this point. Let's hope that we have appropriate technology for rewarding you. Uh, thank you very much. This is Jeffrey Fox signing off the course on Big Data Applications and Technologies and OREX Informatics. Thank you very much again. Goodbye.